Today the first thing that I am going to show you will be electric field lines due to a point charge, due to an electric dipole and due to lots of different configurations. So here we have a point charge and Jim is going to and do you see that there is this some kind of a fiber that is lining up in the direction of the electric field line. So the, this is the point charge right here and what which way should be the electric field due to a point charge? Tell me. Yeah, if it's, if it's positive then it points radially outward and if it's negative it points radially inward. Here you cannot see the arrows but you can see that the electric field lines are radial because that's the way the, the fibers are lining up, the nylon fibers. Okay, Jim, can we do it for dipole please? Okay, so this, these show the electric field lines for a point charge and now we are going to see what is the electric field line due to an electric dipole. Does anybody remember what it looks like? Electric field lines always start at the positive charge and they go towards negative, right? They always end at negative charges. In a dipole, since you have equal positive and negative, right? So plus Q and minus Q, the field lines will start at the positive and they will go towards the negative. Do you see that here? So field lines you can see are going from one of the charge to the other charge. Of course, again, you cannot see the arrows, but all of these field lines, if you like, they'll go from here to there, from here to there, right? All the way through. And we said that if we had to mathematically find the electric field at a particular point, we can find the vector sum of the electric field due to each of the charges, right? Sorry, this thing has nothing to do with that right now. Jim, can you show two positive charges? Can anybody make a guess? You know, just try to make a guess in your mind about what would the electric field lines look like if we didn't have a dipole, but if we had two positive charges which were equal in magnitude separated by a distance. Can you make a guess? See, if we had just one point charge, the electric field lines will just be radially outward, right? Here, they'll be radially outward if that was the only one. But if there are two, will these charges repel each other? And because of that, what will happen is in between the two charges, the field lines will kind of get bent somewhat like this. So the bending will not be as obvious in these directions, but it will be obvious when you look at uh, the, this region. Do you kind of see it here? See these are two charges which are of the same sign. And you can see that here right in between the electric field lines are kind of going like this. Whereas in this region, which is far away from there, it's still radial, pretty much look, roughly, not completely, but you can see that field lines are affected less in the, these regions and they bend here, kind of showing the repulsion. Is that making sense? Okay, Jim, how about uh, parallel plate capacitors? Now, in this course, we are going to spend a lot of time talking about the electric field between two metal plates which have equal and opposite charge. In fact, I will start talking about it today and this kind of a configuration is called parallel plate capacitor. So, in fact, I think there are two chapters which are completely dedicated to this thing. So, we are going to spend a lot of time on this. And this word may be something that we will learn about later. Don't worry about the word capacitor. As I said, we'll have two full chapters on it. The thing that I want to say today is parallel plate capacitor means you have two metal plates. One of them has some positive charge plus Q and the other one has negative charge minus Q. So they're equal and opposite charges on two metal sheets like this. So you have two metal sheets with equal and opposite charges Again, can you see that the electric field will be pointing from the positive sheet to the negative sheet? It turns out that in this case, the electric field is pretty uniform. So the electric field pretty much points like this from the positive to negative plates. It's true that there is some fringing here. So there'll be, there might be a little bit of curving at the two ends. But if you look in the center, the electric field is pretty uniform in most of the place. On the other hand, what about this side and that side? 
it turns out that you can show that the electric field is roughly zero in those regions. And in fact, I will help you see that today when we calculate the electric field due to this. But look here, do you see that the electric field is pretty uniform and it's pointing from one sheet to the other here? Because that's the way these nylon fibers are lining up. Okay, here it doesn't look like the field is zero and that's because these plates are not infinite in extent. What we are going to do in the class today is we are going to show what happens if these sheets were infinitely, you know, had infinite area. So that means they extended all the way. <coughs> if you couldn't see where the edges were, so the, these were extremely large sheets. In those cases, what you will see is that the electric field in these regions is zero. Here it is not because of the fact that this thing is finite in extent. But the focus in this course will be between the two plates and you can see that the electric field lines are pretty much perpendicular to these sheets. Do you see? And that is something that we are going to even prove today for sheets that are infinite in extent. Jim, did we have anything else or? Huh? No, this is great. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Okay, so any questions about electric field lines? Is this look, looking good? All right, so let's do a few concept tests before we move on. So here is the first question for you. It says, which of the arrows show is in the direction of the net force on charge B? Notice you need to focus on charge B. There are two other charges here. Please talk to a person next to you. You have one minute to answer this question. Oops. problem. So we should really be drawing. So we have to find the force on B. So here is the charge B which is plus one unit. This is charge A which is minus one unit. And then here is charge C which is plus one unit. And you can see that the, if we draw the free body diagram of B, it feels a force of attraction towards A, right? So there will be a force that will be pointing in this direction. Let's call it F's of A. And then B will be repelled from C. Do you see it will be repelled from C because these are both positive charges. And hence there will be a force on B that is pointing upward. We can give it any name we feel like. But let's give it a name FC so that it reminds us that it's the force that B is feeling due to C. Now all we have to do is find the vector sum of these two forces, right? What do you think is the choice? None of these because if these are the two vectors, you know, if I have a vector FA like this and I have another vector FC like this, first of all, a good way to find the resultant force is to make them head to tail. So slide this vector, you're always, you know, allowed to slide the vector so long as you don't change its orientation. Remember, this is what you learned in physics one, so you can slide this here. This is your FC. Now since they are head to tail, you, you can see resultant is going to be given by this hypotenuse. This is F resultant, right? And you can see it's pointing this way at some angle, which we can figure out by doing tangent theta th th will be equal to FC divided by FA. But since there's no arrow that is showing that direction, the answer is none of the above. Okay. Any questions about that, folks? Okay, let's look at another question then. So here is another question. It shows, it says the picture below shows a particle labeled B, which has a net electric charge of plus one unit. So here's particle B. 
Several centimeters to the left is another particle labeled A, which has a net charge of minus two units. Choose the pair of force vectors that correctly compare the electric force on A caused by B with electric force on B caused by A. So you have five choices. Talk to a person next to you. Your time starts now. All right, so in this case, we can see that these are opposite char charges with opposite signs, right? So they definitely attract. So you can see, you can tell that the arrows definitely should be going towards each other, right? Because they are attracting. Now the question is, what about the magnitudes? Now we know from Coulomb's law that the force, the magnitude of the force between the two charges should be K times Q1 times Q2 divided by R square. And should this be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction for both of them from Newton's third law? Yes. And so we know that the size of the arrow should be the same. And the only one that shows equal size arrows is this one, right? So the correct answer is B. Is everybody convinced that the correct answer is B because it's an attractive force and it is <clears throat> from Newton's third law, it must be equal in magnitude and opposite in directions. So this is the right answer. Let's look at another question here. Okay, it says in the figure below, positive charge Q2 and Q3 exert on charge Q1, a net electric force that points along the x-axis. So you have two charges, Q2 and Q3, and they exert a force on Q1 that points in the positive x direction. If a positive charge, capital Q, like this, is added at some point B0, that means on the x-axis, what now will happen to the force on Q1? All charges are fixed at their location. You have five choices. A, no change in the size of net force on Q. Uh, since Q is on the x-axis, the size of the net force will change, but not the direction. The net force will decrease, and the direction may change because of the interaction between Q and the positive charges Q1 and Q3. The net force will increase, and the direction may change because the interaction between Q and positive charges Q2 and Q3 cannot determine without knowing the magnitudes of Q1 and or Q. Notice all of these charges are fixed in their location, okay? None of the charges is moving. So it's not like they are going to fly apart. Please talk to a person next to you. You have one minute to answer this question. <laughs> Okay, it looks like folks, time is over. It looks like most of you got the right answer. The correct answer is B. Very good, you guys are doing an excellent job. Now, in order to figure the answer out, the first thing we have to figure out is what is the sign of Q1? What do you think is the sign of Q1? Is it a positive charge or a negative charge? Right, it has to be a negative charge. How do we know this? 
The reason we know this is because we have been told this, we have been told that Q1 has a net force that points along positive x-axis. You know, if Q1 has a force that po points along the positive x-axis in the first case, so this is the before situation, you can see that if Q1 was negative, let's think about it, if Q1 is a negative charge and those two charges are positive, this is plus Q2 and this is plus Q3, which way will Q1 feel a force due to Q3? Will it be attracted? Yeah. So it will feel a force in this direction. Let's give it a name. We can call it, if you like, just F3. What about the force on Q1 due to Q2? Is it attractive also? Yeah, it is attractive and it will be pointing that way along the line joining the two charges. So let's give it a name F2. Now it is possible that if we look at, if suppose we call this X axis and suppose we call this Y axis, we can find the components of F2 and one component will be like this. This is F2X, then there will be an F2Y. Similarly, there is component of F3 and F3X will be like this. And F3Y will be pointing down. Now, in this particular situation, if the net force is along the x-axis in this situation, that means F2Y and F3Y must cancel, right? But one thing you can see is that if Q1 was not negative, if it was positive, these arrows wouldn't have pointed this way, they would have pointed this way, right? And so that then it cannot give you a force along positive x-axis. Is everybody agreeing that the charge must be negative in order for it to feel a net force? So now F net here, you know, is along the x-axis and that's just equal to F3x plus F2x. But I'm just saying if this was negative, if, sorry, if this charge was positive, as everybody seeing, this, would have, this charge would have been repelled from this, then it would have been this way. This charge would have repelled, been repelled from that, the force F2 would have been that way. It couldn't have given us a force in the positive x direction. So one thing is this charge is negative. Great. Now, what will be the effect of adding a positive charge on the x-axis? If I ch add a positive charge plus Q here, is everybody seeing in addition to what we found from these two, which is already written here, there is one other force that we need to add vectorially to the sum, right? Which way will the third thing be? Let's give it a name. Let's call it Q4. Which way will be the force on Q1 due to Q4? If this is a negative charge, this is a positive charge, is this charge attracted towards that? Yes, so is everybody seeing that F4 is pointing in the positive x direction, right? So is everybody seeing that F net nu with this charge will become plus F4? We have to add all four of them. But it is still in the positive x direction, and hence the direction will not change, but the magnitude of the force actually increases, right? Is everybody agreeing with this? Any questions about this? All right, so this is all the questions that we have for today. Let's move on. And actually, let me ask you one other question, which is not a concept, which is not written here, but it may be helpful for you. By the way, does everybody know that there are tutorials posted on the web that are systematic tutorials that will help you learn some of these concepts, you know, at your own pace, at your own time? Suppose I give you two different questions. Think with a partner, you know, somebody who's next to you. Suppose I say, okay, you have a charge plus Q here and a charge plus 6Q here and say the dif distance between these two charges is, you know, one centimeter or something. And that, then you have another situation where you have a charge plus Q here and you have a charge minus 6Q here. The only difference between these two situations is that one of these charges has negative sign compared to this one. The question that I have for you is, think with the person next to you, where along the line joining the two charges is the, can the electric field be zero? In region one, let's call it region one, let's call this region two, and let's call this region three. So this is region one here for this picture. This is region two between the two charges, and region three is beyond the plus Q, plus six Q charge. So this is region three. In each of these cases, I want you to say, 
which region may have a point where the net electric field is 0 due to the two charges. Please talk to a person next to you. You have one minute to think about this. For each of these cases, Anybody wants to share their thoughts about this, this particular problem? Should it be region 1, 2, or 3, or more than one region? Please go ahead. Number 1? OK. So somewhere over here, you mean? Oh, you're talking about this case. So you're say, saying in this particular case, there might be some point over here, maybe at some distance that we can call x away from this charge, but in region 1, where the electric field E might be 0. Is that what you're saying? How many people agree with him? OK, good. What about in this case? Somebody else, please? Go ahead. Region 2? OK, so you are saying somewhere in this, between these two charges, maybe over here or something, there might be a point where electric field might be 0 at some distance, which we can again give a name x, which we can figure out. This, you know, if you like, you can call it x2 and x1, because these things don't have to be the same numbers. How many people agree with this? Very good. It looks like you guys are doing a really good job. Because one thing is that if the electric field is 0, that means one thing we know is that the electric field due to the two charges must definitely point in the opposite directions in that region. Isn't that true? Because otherwise, you cannot cancel the electric field. So let's try and see what happens here. At this point, we know that this charge plus Q will have its electric field, let's say this way, because it's positive charge. Remember, the electric field due to a positive charge is radially away from it. So if you ask me which way is the electric field over here due to this charge, I'll say it's radially away like this. If you ask me here, it's radially away like this, right? OK, what about the, so let's give it a name E1. And what about the electric field due to this one? It'll be radially away from this charge because it's also positive, And so it'll be this way. Let's give it a name E2. Now, if we want E to be 0, if we choose this to be x-axis, you can see that what we want is that net electric field should be 0. That means E1 minus E2 should be equal to 0, right? Isn't that what we want? And that means, what is E1? Let me write it here. That means that K, Q1, Let's give it a name. Q, by Q1, I mean this charge Q divided by R1 square should be equal to K Q2 divided by R2 square. Right? And what are these things? So Q1 might be just Q. Q2 is 6Q. So in this particular case, you can see what we end up with is Q R1, what is R1? X. Yeah, that's what we call X2, let's say. And by the way, K and K get cancelled from both sides. Q2 is 6Q. So 6Q, K and K got cancelled. And what is R2? Yeah, it's 1 centimeter minus, minus <laughs> X2. So the thing is, and 1 centimeter, let's say that you know we are using SI unit, then we, 1 centimeter will be how many meters? Yeah, 0 0.01 meter minus x2 square, right? And then at this point, you know, can I cancel q since q is the same? So what we have is 0 0.01 minus x2 
square is equal to 6 times x2 square. Take the square root of both sides that gives you 0 0.01 minus x2 is equal to square root 6 x2, right? And that means 0 0.01 is equal to square root 6 and this one goes to the other side plus 1 times x2 and so x2 turns out to be you can see 0 0.01 divided by square root 6 plus 1 meters, right? Is that making sense? But what the, the important thing here is why couldn't there be a point in the other two regions? Is there a problem in the other two regions? What if I thought that there should be a point here? Is there a problem? Yes, because which way is the electric field at this point due to this charge? Away from it this way. What about due to this charge? Again, at this point, the electric field due to that charge will be also this way because it's away from that charge. Is that making sense? Can they ever cancel out? If two, two vectors are pointing in the same direction, can they ever cancel? They can't. So there cannot be a point that way. What about in this region? Same problem. The electric field due to the positive charge here will be away from it. Due to this positive charge, it will be away from it. Both vectors point in the same direction. They cannot cancel, right? In this case, what about this point? Let's think about it. Which way is the electric field at this point due to this charge? It's a positive charge, so the electric field here must be away from it. So let's give it a name E1. What about the electric field at this point due to this charge? Towards it. Okay. And so, yeah, again, you can work out you know, where the electric field will be zero. Again, you can see from here that if this is my positive x direction, at this point, I should have E net equal to zero. And that means E2 minus E1 should be equal to zero. And what does that tell you? That tells you E2 is, let me write down, k times 6q magnitude divided by what distance square? What is the distance of this point? If this is one centimeter, what is the distance of this point from here? Right. Everybody should see that it's 0 0.01 meter plus x1. Right? And this should be equal to, by the way, this thing means E2 should be equal to E1. And so this should be equal to k times q divided by x1 square. Right? Because this is what I'm calling Q1, this is what I'm calling Q2. And then at this point, you can solve for it, right? Cancel the K, cancel the Q, 6 is left over. All you have to do is 6 times x1 square should be equal to 0 0.01 plus x1 square, right? And you can solve for it. So you can again solve for 6 x1 square is equal to 0 0.01 plus x1 square. And so this one says that square root 6 x1 is equal to 0 0.01 plus x1, right? And that means square root 6 minus 1 x1 is equal to 0 0.01 or x1 should be equal to 0 0.01 divided by square root 6 minus 1 meter. Notice that there is a positive sign here. In this case, there is a negative sign there, right? That's not the, the, that's not the most important point I was trying to draw your attention to. The question that I also want to ask you is why couldn't a point be here between the two charges where the electric field cancels out? Suppose if I think of a point here, which way is the electric field due to positive charge? Away from it, right? So at this point, the electric field due to this, E1 will be this way. What about the electric field due to the negative charge? Is it towards it? Yes. So E2 is also going to be in the same direction. Can they ever cancel? No. So I couldn't have a point here where the net electric field is zero. Why not on this side? You know, let's think about a point here at some distance x1 away here. Could there be a point like this? Let's think about it. The electric field due to the negative charge at this point will be which way? Towards it. So I can say E2 is this way. What about the electric field due to the positive charge? It's away from it, so it will be this way. Could they cancel each other out? They couldn't. Why not? Because 
Very good, because you also have to think about the magnitude. See, that point is closer to the stronger charge. So first of all, when you think about this kq over r square, if the charge is stronger and if the distance is smaller, do you see that the stronger charge here will always have a larger influence? In other words, E2 is always going to be more on this side compared to E1. And so there's no way for E2 to be equal in magnitude to E1 on that side. On this side, sure, because this point is closer to the weaker charge, right? Because see, the only way that if suppose Q1 is not equal to Q2, right? Suppose Q1 is not equal to Q2, then you can see that the only way you can make these two things equal is if R1 is not equal to R2, right? And if Q1 is stronger, then R1 better be larger also. That means the distance of that point from where we are trying to find the electric field, the distance of the charge from the point where we are trying to find the electric field should be more if that is a stronger charge, if you wanted to cancel the influence with some other charge. Any questions about this, folks? Okay, so then today we are going to do a few leftover things from chapter 22. One thing is all of the cases that we have talked about so far have dealt with charges that are discrete. That by discrete, I mean, you know, there is one point charge here, there's another point charge there, etc. What if I tell you that I have something on which charges are continuously distributed? You know, I say to you, you know, I have this ring, I have a ring on which I have distributed some charge uniformly. Maybe this is my, you know, bracelet or something. So I'll, I can say, oh, what if I put charges uniformly on this bracelet? And let's say that this, uni this bracelet is a uniform ring and, and this, this one is thick actually, but suppose if it was very thin and I say to you, tell me the electric field due to all of the charges here, which add up to Q total at some point, which is along the axis of this, this ring. So today we are going to deal with ch continuous charges and finding the electric field due to them. Again, do you think we could still use Coulomb's law and superposition principle? Yes. The only thing is that here, if the charges are uniformly distributed, then what we have to remember is that Coulomb's law only applies to point charges. So we can say, what will be the electric field due to a small charge here? Let's an infinitesimal charge on this ring somewhere, which we can call dq, which is still a point charge. And that one will still have electric field k q over r square. Now what we have to do is vectorially at this point, vectorially add the contribution of all the little dqs that make up this bracelet, right? Do you see that? doing vectorially adding all of the contribution for the case where the charge is uniformly distributed what is a continuous uh, addition called <coughs> yeah that's an integration right when you are doing some continuous addition that's an integration so basically what we'll have to do in all of these cases is do a continuous addition or an integration let's try and see how it works out so let's calculate today electric field due to a thin uniform ring of charge. The total charge Q. Okay, this is what we are trying to do. And by uniform I mean charge is uniformly distributed on the ring. Okay, also we are trying to find the electric field on a, along a line which is, sorry, at any point along the axis of this ring. So you can tell me, okay, tell me the electric field at this point P, which is along the axis of this ring. This ring, let's say it's ha it has positive charge, uniformly distributed. I can't draw a uniform charge, but assume that this charge is uniform everywhere, okay? I'm also going to define something called lambda. Lambda will be defined as charge per unit length. Okay? And this is what is called the, you can call it the linear charge density.
Okay? So let's say that the radius of this ring is r. So if I told you that the total charge on this ring is q and charge per unit length is lambda, can you tell me the relationship between the two things? Everybody should be taking half a minute to talk to a person next to them and I want you to tell me if the total charge is q, charge per unit length is lambda, how should the two things be related? You know, so, so is everybody understanding? Lambda is how much charge there is. Okay, I, I, I cannot pull these things out, but the point is how much charge there is on one unit length of the ring, right? Now, Q is the total charge everywhere, included, including everywhere. So how should the two things be related if the radius of this thing is R? Okay, somebody from the fourth row, please go ahead. Anybody? Fourth row wants, wants to share their thoughts? Any, anybody wants to share their thoughts, please? You multiply lambda by the like, circumference of the ring. Very good. You multiply it by the circumference, which in this case will be 2 pi times r, right? Do you see that if this is the charge per unit length, you multiply it by the total length, you get the total charge, right? Is this making sense? This is the circumference of this ring. Okay, so let's try to solve this problem. Before we solve anything, the question we have to find you have to answer is what is the electric field at point P which is on the axis of this ring at some point. Let's say that the distance from the center of this ring of this point is x. Now here is the thing, even before we do the whole problem, let's figure out what would be the direction of electric field. That will make our life so much simpler. In order to think about the direction of electric field at this point along the axis of this ring, Let's think of, say, two small infinitesimal point charges that make up this ring. So obviously, if we want to be able to use Coulomb's law and superposition principle, we need to break up this ring into small charges. Let's say dq here, dq, 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 dq all over the place. Let's think of one little dq here and another little dq here, okay, which is right opposite of that. Tell me from Coulomb's law, what would be the direction of the electric field due to this little dq at this point p? If all these are positive charges, go ahead please. Which way will it be? Again, you know, radially away from it, right? Because it's a positive charge, so it'll be like this. Let's give it a name E1. Which way will be the electric field due to this little dq? This small infinitesimal charge dq for which we could use Coulomb's law because we can think of it as point charge, please? Uh, away. Yeah, again, it will be radially away from it at this point. So it will be, let me erase this to make it neater. So which will be like this, let's call it E2. Okay, if both of these are the same charges, dq, small infinitesimal charge that we have picked, and if these distances, look at this distance, you know, let's give it some name. Let's call it r. If this is distance r and so is this distance, would you say that the magnitude of electric field E2 and E1 will be equal? Because it'll be just k dq over r square, right? That'll be this. And this one will be also, E1 will be, have, have a magnitude k dq over this r square. And so the magnitudes are equal. Now, if I say, okay, let's choose this as my x direction, this as my y direction, is everybody seeing if I take the component of E2, there will be an E2x and E2y. Similarly, there'll be an E1x and E1y will be pointing down. And is everybody agreeing that if the E2 and E1 had the same magnitude, E1y and E2y that point in opposite directions will cancel out. In other words, the contributions of these two infinitesimal charges on this ring will be, you know, just E1x plus E2x and it will be pointing in the x direction that we chose. So that means along the direction of the, of the axis, right? Along the axial direction, if you like, this way. Now, what if I think of two other 
points on this ring. Let us say one little dq here and another little dq which is totally opposite of this. You know, this is a three dimensional picture. I am having a hard time drawing it on the picture, but uh, dry, drawing the picture on the board. But think of a ring like this. I am trying to find the electric field at a point over there along the axis. Do you see if I pick two points which are opposite, which have charge dq, their electric fields point like this. Their components along this direction cancel. Similarly, if I pick two points on the ring, say over here, again, their electric fields will be pointing like this. Their component in that direction will add up and the, these components cancel. Do you see that? And similarly, I can do this with any two points here and here, here and here. So, every point will have a pair in such a way that the component in the direction perpendicular to the x direction that we have chosen cancels out. So, is everybody convinced that from the symmetry of this problem, the net electric field due to the whole ring must point only in the x direction? Is everybody convinced of that? Okay, great. So, the thing is, so we have already found direction, half done. So, we know that the net electric field must be along x direction. Great. At this point, we just have to find the magnitude. Notice also, if we call, if we decide to call this angle theta, then do you see that this angle is theta also? This is one straight line, this is opposite, opposite, this is a line that intersects it. So, if this is angle theta, this is theta too. So, what is the component along the x axis of these things? Do you see that E 2 x will be E 2 times? cosine of the angle that we have chosen. Similarly, E 1 will be E 1 times cosine of the angle. So, it is the cosine components that survive. So, I want all of you to be convinced and if you are not, this is the right time to ask that E net, let us just give it a name E, we do not even need to call it E net. So, this is the net electric field E will be basically, you know, the x component E x and let us give it a name D E x which is because, because this is due to all the infinitesimal charges, right, integrated over the whole ring. Uh, one way to say this is basically E net will be equal to sum over D E x. This is the sum. This is have you ever seen the sign sigma denoting a sum? Basically, all it means is that this is de 1x plus de 2x plus de 3x, you know, plus dot 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 de 4x, etc. But remember that these things are very close to each other. So, really, this sum is actually an integral. Do you know what I am saying? Sums you know, go to integral, the sums can be written as integral when these things are so close to each other, which they are, because look, there is a little dq everywhere. It is not like I have one point charge here and another one there, okay. So, basically then, <clears throat> basically this is what we have and who wants to tell me what is dex? Can I write that as de times? cosine theta, right? It is. What is dE? So, what, what dE means the electric field due to some little charge dQ which is at a distance r away. Tell me, somebody, somebody please tell me. dE can be written as K from Coulomb's law, dQ divided by r square, right? But remember, we also have this cosine theta here because it is only the x component that we are adding vectorially. And all of the x components point in the same direction. So, all we have to do is just add it up, which is what this integral says. Integral means just add it up, add up all the x components. Is this making sense, folks? Okay. So, at this point, let us just try to plug in values. These are not very difficult uh, integrals to do. They, actually, this one is so trivial that you will be amazed. So, all we have here, let me try to do it over here, is A is equal to k dq, 
Can I pull k out of the integral? Yeah, k is just a constant, I can pull it out and then I have integral dq. What is r square in terms of things we know? Because notice what I gave you is this radius of the ring and I gave you that the distance of this point p on the axis from the center of the ring is x. What is r in terms of capital R and x? Anybody? Very good. Do you see that this is a right angle triangle and capital R square plus x square is little r square? So in terms of things that we know, I can write this as r square plus x square. This is r square, right? Similarly, can we write cosine theta in terms of things that we know? Tell me from this triangle here, what is cosine theta? Very good. Does everybody see that cosine theta here is x divided by uh, little r? So in other words, cosine theta is equal to x divided by little r. In other words, I can write cosine theta as x divided by r square plus x square square root, right? So let's write it down. So instead of this cosine theta, I'm going to write here um, x divided by r square plus x square. By the way, is everybody familiar that square root can be written as to the power 1 half? So I'm writing the square root as to the power 1 half, all right? Okay, so this is cosine theta. So cosine theta was put right here as this thing. Now I want to ask you a question. We have to integrate this thing over the whole ring. Now is, if we integrate it over all points on the ring, think about this three-dimensional picture. Here's my ring. And there's the point over there at a distance x away from the center. Is the distance of all the points on the ring the same from that point P? Think about it three-dimensionally. So is, the question is, first of all, R was the same for all points, wasn't it? So in other words, x squared plus R squared is the same for all points on the ring. So whether I choose a point over here, its distance is this R, same r, same r. You may not see it in this two-dimensional picture that I drew, but just think in your head. You have a ring like this. A point is over there. Do you see every point on the ring is at a distance small r away? So it's not surprising that capital R obviously is fixed because this is the radius of the ring. We are not changing it. Is x fixed also? Yeah, because I told you to find the electric field at a distance x away from the axis. So everything is constant here except this dq. We have to do this integral over the whole ring. So this is the simplest integral that you can ever get because at this point, all the constants can be pulled out. And here, everything is a constant. By the way, what can we write r square plus x square? This is to the power 1 and this is to the power half. What can we write it as? Do you see 1 plus a half is 3 over 2? Right? This thing gave us, this r square gave us to the power 1, and this came from cosine theta. So we have 1 plus a half, which is 3 over 2, and then we have integral dq over whole ring. What is integral dq over the whole ring? Yeah, that's the total charge on the ring, right? Because it's like integral means you add up, the, add up all the little dqs on this ring, and if you add up all the little dqs, it gives you the total charge on the ring. So this thing then is just kxq divided by r squared plus x squared to the power 3 over 2. Right? Is that making sense, folks? Any questions about this? <coughs> So is this the answer? <coughs> yeah, this is the answer. So this is the magnitude of electric field and its direction is along the positive x direction. This is the magnitude of electric field at a distance x away on the axis of the ring, you know, 
due to the charges all over the ring. Yeah, any questions about this? And the direction is along the positive x direction. So in combining this with the magnitude, you have the full answer, right? Okay, now here is the thing. I want to do a more difficult problem with you. So now I want to say, can you find the electric field due to a disk of charge? So I don't just have a thin ring. I have a disk. I have a circular disk and the charge is uniformly distributed on that disk. The question is, can you find the electric field again along the axis at a distance x away from this disk? How would you do that problem? One thing is, you can always make use of what you've already learned. What you know is that the electric field due to a ring must be along x direction and its magnitude is this. We, can we break the disk into lots of little rings of different radii? You know, if you have a circular disk, right? So, so now we are going to find electric field due to a uniform disk of charge at a point on its axis. So we have, here is my disk, this whole thing now has charge, right? And let's say this, this is positive charge and it's uniformly distributed everywhere on this disk. Let's say that the radius of this ri disk is capital R. We have to find the electric field at some point P, which is at a distance x away from this disk, right? I'm saying we can exploit what we already know. We can think about if suppose this was not a disk, if I were just looking at the contribution of one little thin ring that makes up this disk, let's say that this ring has a thickness dr and it is at a distance small r away from the center of this disk. Can we find the contribution of just this little thin ring? Will you say that since the charges are uniformly distributed on this ring here, the electric field here due to this, again, just like this thing, will definitely be pointing along the x direction, if we are calling this direction the x direction here, and that the contribution should add up to this. Right? Just that, this time, what integral are we going to do? Go ahead, please. Can you just integrate the equation we've done already, except this time the respect to radius? Excellent. So this time, if I say what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the total electric field by integrating the electric field contribution due to each ring. So all the rings, all rings, integrate over all rings that make the disk. And this, what is this DE? DE is the contribution of each of the ring that makes up the disk. Do you see that there is a little ring which has zero radius? Then there is another little ring here. Then there's another little ring here. Then there's another little ring here. Then there's another little ring here, etc., etc. All the way till you get to the edge of the thing. So in fact, what will be the contribution of each of the ring? This is the contribution of each of the rings. So who wants to tell me what will be DE here? Can you read it off here from there? Yes, we can. The only thing is that what are we now calling capital R for this ring here? What are we calling, what is the equivalent of capital R? What was capital R here? That was the radius of the ring, right? Here, the ring that I have chosen right now, let me show you again, it's getting dirty so you can't see it. I'm saying I am going to choose some ring somewhere. This is what you do in calculus. You just pick some ring somewhere at a distance small r away, which has a thickness dr 
and charges are uniformly distributed on this ring, right? This is one of those rings. So what is the equivalent of capital R here in that case? Isn't it small r? So can I say that the electric field DE due to each little ring is going to be K? And let's say that the charge, the, let's say that the charge on each of these rings is DQ. DQ is the total charge on the ring. So then can we say that the electric field DE due to one ring will be K X DQ divided by, R, instead of capital R, this radius is what we are calling small r. Do you see that? So can I say small r squared plus x squared to the power 3 over 2 for this problem? <coughs> okay. So it's going to be r squared plus x squared to the power 3 over 2. Now you know that dq, I want to write the dq in terms of what is called charge density. So we are going to define something called the charge density or charge per unit length, sorry, charge per unit area in this case. So I'm going to define something called sigma, which is charge per unit area of the ring. It is also called charge density. Okay, so now how can I write charge density? Can I write if the total charge on the ring is Q? How can I write the charge density and how can I relate it to dQ? Can you tell me the relation between dQ and sigma? dQ, which is the charge on a ring, yeah, go ahead, please, should be equal to sigma times the what? The, uh, the area of the ring, very good. So it should be dQ is the charge on the ring of radius r and thickness dr, right? So then we know that dQ must be equal to charge per unit area times the area. But now the question is, what is the area of that ring of radius r and thickness dr? What should I write here? Anybody? So dQ is equal to sigma times the area of the ring and area of the ring is? 2 pi r is its circumference times? The thickness, dr, very good. So the area of the ring is the circumference times the thickness. Right? So this is our dq. So let's plug it here in this equation here. And at this point, we will have to do a difficult integral. But in physics, you know what you do? You open a table of integrals, you look up what those integrals are. So the, but the thing is, getting here was something that we did on our own. That's what physics is. Physics is figuring out how, what you have to do. And at that point, you just go to a table of integral and you look it up. So, and this time, we do have to do a difficult integral, which we will look up. So, what we have found so far, this is where we are. And we are saying the total electric field E has a magnitude which is integral k x. And instead of Q, I'm going to write sigma 2 pi r dr divided by this thing, r squared plus x squared to the power 3 over 2. Okay, just so that you understand some of these things very well, I want you to understand what are you going to look up in the integral table? Which things are constant? Because all the things that are constants, we should be able to pull them out, right? So is k constant? 
Yeah, pull it up. Is x constant? Sure, because x is the distance of the point where we want to find the electric field from the center of this disk. So that's constant. Pull it out, sigma. Sure, that's charge per unit area constant. 2 pi, yes. So all of that gets pulled out. K, x, sigma, 2 pi. The integral that we are doing is really r dr divided by r square plus x square to the power 3 over 2. And notice, this is an integral over all rings that make up the disk, right? And as one of your friends already suggested, now that we have written this integral in terms of dr, what would be the limit of the integral if we are integrating over all rings that make the disk? You know, the smallest ring will have a radius of 0. Then the next ring will be like this, the next one will be like this, etc., etc., till we get to the largest ring, which is, which has a radius of capital R, the radius of the disk itself. So is everybody say, seeing that integrating or adding up the contribution of all of the rings that make up the disk means the radius, you know, should go from 0 to capital R. And this integral is not easy to do. You can just look it up. So we are just going to write down what it is from a table of integrals. And if you look up the integral, you will find this thing turns out to be sigma over 2 epsilon 0, 1 minus x over x square plus r square. You know, when you do the integral, which variable are you getting rid of? Small r, right? Because small r is the thing that is varying. It could be 0 if I choose a ring here. It could be some distance here, some distance here till we get to capital R. So that's the variable that goes away in my final answer here. So this is after doing the integral. Also notice how did I end up with this epsilon 0? I actually made use of the fact that k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So I cancel this 2 pi with this 4 pi that came from k. Is that making sense, folks? This k was 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So this 2 pi and this gave me a 1 over 2 epsilon 0, right? Is everybody clear? So this is my answer. What would be the direction of electric field? Again, positive x direction, right? So how do I know that? Because each of the ring, each of this little ring that makes the disk gives an electric field that's pointing this way. So I know that the net electric field must be pointing in that direction due to all of the rings. Right, folks? OK, perfect. This is the answer. Now, let me look at some limiting cases with you. What happens if I look at a disk which has a radius r which is almost infinite? So in other words, we are going to look at this limiting case, and this will be extremely useful for this course because we will do this over and over again. Talk to a person next to you and tell me what does this formula simplify to if we look at this extreme case, case. So these are called limiting cases. So if r is way, way, way bigger than x, that means the disk has a huge radius. You're talking about a huge disk, and you're looking at a point that's not too far away from its axis, right? Then what do you think happens? It can be a little, pretty much throughout this term here. You know, if R is a lot bigger, this is like R is a billion dollars, and this is one cent. One cent divided by something which has billion dollars in the denominator, do you see that's almost zero? So in this case, electric field magnitude will be sigma over 2 epsilon zero. Notice that you don't even have to have R be really infinite because of the fact that so long as you're looking at a point, so long as you say, I, I want to find the electric field at a point x, which is not too far away from the axis of this disk, from, from the center of this disk, then so long as r is a lot bigger than x, this will be true. And this is the approximation that we are going to use throughout this course. So when I tell you about you know, large disk of charge, 
you can say, okay, so we are looking at a limiting case where we can assume that R is a lot larger. That means the radius of the disk is a lot larger. Here is the R. R is this radius, okay? So this is the charge here on the disk. R is a lot larger than some point X where you are trying to find the electric field, okay? So this is a lot larger than this. Then this is good. And this is what we will mostly focus on. Any questions about this? Okay. Now, let's think about what will happen if we have two very large disks. And again, this is, you know what I'm getting to? I'm getting to that case that I was calling parallel plate capacitors. Remember, I, was, I started this lesson with showing you these two disks here. And they don't look like infinite disks. Let me show you. See, this disk has a finite size, right? It doesn't look like its radius is infinite. And moreover, it's not even circular. But you know what? If I'm looking at the electric field at a point which is very, very close to, the, to this, so if x is extremely small compared to the size of this, then do you see that the end ends won't matter very much. So whether it's square, rectangular, circular, it won't really matter. For all those cases, you can use that the electric field due to each, you know, sheet, you can start calling it sheet, is sigma over 2 epsilon 0. So if you like, we can just call it electric field due to a sheet with uniform charge at a point close to the sheet. And when I say at a point close to the sheet, this is what I mean. Where you are finding the electric field is a lot smaller than the dimensions of the sheet. Is everybody convinced that in these cases, whether it's square or circular or rectangular wouldn't matter really? Just think about it. You know, so long as you put charge on this thing, right? So you put charge on, you put charge on this thing everywhere uniformly. And I'm saying find the electric field here really, really close to the sheet. You know, this is almost looking like an infinite sheet as far as that point is concerned. So the edge effects are not important and the actual shape is not going to be important. So you can think of it almost as this limiting case. Okay, to find the electric field due to a sheet of charge which is very large compared to the distance where you're trying to find the electric field from the sheet. Is this idea clear? Because this should be clear before we can move on. Any questions about this? Okay, so now what I want you to do is take a moment to talk to a person next to you and think about what if on the exam I gave you a problem like this. I said there are two sheets now and they might as well be your parallel plate capacitor sheets that I was showing you. One of them has a charge plus Q. Another one has a charge minus Q. In terms of sigma, let's, call, let's say that one of them has charge density plus sigma. Another one has a charge density minus sigma. Tell me what should be the electric field at some point between the two plates, to the left of it, and to the right of it? This is your question. For due to two sheets now, not one sheet. Can you use superposition principle now? Yeah. So you know that the electric field due to each of these sheets is going to be this. You know how to use the vector addition of these things. So you should be able to find the net electric field at, in any of these three regions, right? This side, in the middle, and on that side. Isn't that true? So that's what you will have to do now. And as I said, this result is going to be so important, you will use it over and over again, and I'm not exaggerating in this course. Because that will be the electric field due to a parallel plate capacitor, which has plus and minus charges on two sheets, which are relatively large in dimension compared to the place where we are going to be interested in finding the electric field. So take a moment, and everybody should be talking to a person next to them about this question. So you have plus sigma, 
minus sigma. It's all right. You have to go. Please, absolutely, no problem. Absolutely. it together so one thing that I wanted to ask even before we proceed is that if the, we said that if the sheet has positive charge then the electric field points you know away from it what if the sheet has negative charge will the electric field point towards it yeah because we can do all of the analysis just like the way we did earlier except okay not here but all these, all this analysis that we had done earlier, we can do the same kind of analysis. I have erased it, it looks like. Like here, except, you know, electric field, instead of pointing that way, when I look at a ring, the, if this charge was negative, do you see that each little dq will make a contribution towards it like this? And so the net will be this way. So instead of the electric field being pointing, being in that way, it will now become this way, towards the sheet. That's it. That will be the only difference. Okay, so if that is one thing, another thing that you notice, which is a really interesting result, is if the sheet is really large in dimensions compared to the distance where you're finding the electric field, then hey, the electric field, does it depend upon the distance from the sheet? It doesn't, there is no R here at all. And that's a very important result. The, the important result says that if the sheet is big enough, if this sheet is big enough, if R, that means the dimension of this in this case is very big, then whether I look at the electric field at this point here or a little bit far away, a little bit far away, the electric field will be the same. It's sigma over 2 epsilon 0, right? So long as I don't go so far away that this is not no longer an infinite sheet. So that I cannot, so so long as I can make this approximation, the electric field doesn't depend upon the distance from the sheet. Isn't that a nice result? Okay, so if these two are results, who wants to tell me how we can find the electric field, say, at this point due to both of these sheets? Should we first think about the direction due to each of these sheets and then later worry about the magnitude? Very good. Who wants to tell me about the directions? Tell me. Somebody from here, please help me. I want to find the electric field at some point. Let's pick it over here somewhere in this way, please. So which way will be the electric field due to the positive sheet? Yeah, in region two. Yeah, this is a positive sheet and we, we are saying, you know, so this is like, this is a positively charged sheet and we are looking at some point over here and we just now saw that for a disk, the electric field is in the positive x direction if the sheet is positive, right? So she's absolutely correct. Let's call it sheet one. This is called, this is sheet one, this is sheet two. So that means the electric field due to sheet one, E1 will be this way. What about the electric field due to sheet two at this point? It will be again towards sheet one because it's negatively charged, right? And remember that if this is a negatively charged sheet, does everybody, does everybody see, remember to turn off your uh, cell phones, folks. If the, if the sheet is negatively charged, does everybody see that the electric field at this point would be towards the sheet, right? Or electric field at this point will be towards the sheet. If it's a positive sheet, electric field will be pointing away from it, away from it. If it's a negative sheet, it will be towards it. Is that clear to everybody? Okay, so then the electric field due to the negative sheet will be also that way, E2. So then which way is the electric field in this region then? If I decide to call this as my x direction, this my x direction, then it's just E1 plus E2, right? And what is it? What is the value of E1 and E2? 
Are E1 and E2 both going to be sigma over 2 epsilon 0 so long as we believe in this? And that is what we are talking about. We are talking about a case where x, the place where we are trying to find the electric field, x in this case will be this, is a lot smaller than the size of the sheet. That means the sheet is huge in all directions. This will always be an assumption we will make throughout this course. I am not going to keep saying it because as I said, there are several chapters totally dedicated to the system and this assumption will be made all the time, okay, that this is true. Okay, so, so is everybody seeing that the electric field in this region, region 2 then will be sigma over 2 epsilon 0 plus sigma over 2 epsilon 0 which is equal to sigma over epsilon 0, right? Okay, somebody from here, please help me find the, and is this the same electric field at every point? Yes. So if I were looking over here, same thing. If I were looking over here, the same thing. So long as I can say, yes, I can make this approximation so that the electric field due to each sheet is this. I can say the net electric field is sigma over 2 epsilon, sigma over epsilon 0 pointing that way. So I can even draw the electric field lines now like this. Is everybody convinced the electric field magnitude is the same everywhere and its direction is the same everywhere also, so long as we ignore the end effects? Let us not worry about the ends. We will only worry about the region where the electric field is uniform, okay? Who wants to tell me about the electric field here? Tell me. Which way will be the electric field at this point due to positive charge? Will it be away from it? Yes. So E1 will be this way. Which way will be the electric field at this point due to the negative charge? Will it be towards it? Yes. So E2 will be towards it. Now you can see that E net here will be E2 minus E1 which is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon 0 minus sigma over 2 epsilon 0 which is equal to 0. So the net electric field everywhere over here in this region is 0. So, so long as you assume that these sheets are huge, almost infinite in extent, you can say that if we have two sheets with equal and opposite charges, the electric field to the left and right of the sheet will be 0 and electric field between these two sheets is going to be constant or uniform and its magnitude will be sigma over 2 epsilon 0 in this region between the two sheets. By the way, here, what will happen here? Is everybody seeing that in this region to the right of the negative sheet, the electric field due to the negative sheet will be? Right, electric field due to the negative sheet will be towards the negative sheet. So let's give it a name E2. The electric field due to the positive sheet will be? away from it, so E1 will be like this and again E1 and E2 will cancel each other out just like here, right? So the, the idea is that this configuration is so nice because if we have two sheets with equal and opposite charges which and these sheets are huge compared to the distances where we are finding the electric field then the electric field is pretty constant, uniform between the she two sheets. It's pointing from positive to negative plate and outside the sheet, the field is pretty much zero. Unless you worry about fringing and the finite size of this, which we are not going to worry about here. Is that making sense, folks? Any questions about this? And this would be the situation for parallel plate capacitor. Now, let me just do a problem with you and this is going to be very similar to the kind of problem that you have in this week's tutorial, by this week I mean the one that is for homework uh, and recitation next week. So basically what happens if we have a uniform electric field here between the two sheets and let me just turn the sheet around so that it looks like this. I can always decide to put this sheet like this. So let's do an example. This is another example and let's say that we are given two sheets and again these sheets are huge compared to the place where we want to find the electric field just like this 
I have just turned it around like this. We know that the field is uniform between the two plates. An electric field points like this. Right? Suppose you are asked, you are given that the electric field is 2 Newton per Coulomb, sorry, 2 Newton per Coulomb and it is pointing down. Now you are told that you launch say a positive charge Q which is let us say 10 to the power minus 6 Coulomb into this field. So when you launch this charge, the question what do you think will happen to that charge? Please. It will go towards the negative plate, excellent answer. What would be the trajectory? What would the path of this positive charge look like? Did you want to say something? Like yeah, it will be a curve down. In fact, it will be exactly parabolic. How do I know it will be parabolic? You should compare this situation with the situation of gravitational field. Think about the gravity close to Earth, right? Which way is the gravitational acceleration? Pointing down, right? Is the gravitational acceleration pretty constant, close to Earth's surface at least? You know, so if I'm looking at just here, you know, I don't have to worry about the variation in the gravitational acceleration. I can assume everywhere the gravitational acceleration is pointing down and it's 9.8 meters per second square. So if you want to think of a gravitational field, the field is pretty constant close to the Earth. And so I want you to compare with gravitational field And you know that is pointing down, you know, you have this field pointing down and if I launch a ball, so suppose this time of course we are launching masses and thinking about what, what will be the effect of mass, what happens to a, this thing launched, the gravitational field is down, I launch it horizontally, let's say I launch it horizontally, do you see it goes parabolic? This is what you learned in projectile motion, didn't you? So what happens is this mass actually goes in a parabolic path and then it goes and hits the ground. Do you see here we are saying that the electric field is constant here and electric field has a magnitude sigma over epsilon 0. This is what we found. Electric field between the two plates is sigma over, two, sigma over epsilon 0 and it is pretty constant. So it is just like gravitational field. In fact, if you remember everything about gravitational field, all of the motion of charged particle will be exactly similar to the motion of mass in a gravitational field. You see the analogy? So in this case, folks, exactly the same kind of thing will happen. This thing will go in a para parabolic path and it will hit the thing somewhere. Now suppose you are given that the mass of this thing is let's say 10 to the power of minus 4 kg and what are the things you are asked? You are asked these things, find the acceleration of this object, of this charged particle. You are asked how much time it takes to hit the surface after it enters the field. This is the time. <clears throat> how do you think you will do this? Go ahead, please. Same thing as uh, kinematics with the gravitation. Very good. You just know everything about how to do projectile motion, this is exactly that, right? The only thing is we have to go systematically again. So if we are going systematically, the first thing we need to do is find acceleration. Folks, can we find acceleration if we are given the charge of the charged particle and the electric field? Do you, we all know we can find the force because what is the relation between force and electric field? This is always true. What is the relation between force and electric field no matter what the situation? This is the first time I taught you electric field when I defined electric field which always works. Yeah, F is equal to QE. That is always true, right? You can find electric field due to a point charge as KQ over R square or you can find the electric field due to two parallel plate capacitors which is sigma over epsilon zero but the point is the basic relation between force and electric field never changes. F is equal to QE for all situations, right? That is by definition of electric field. So we know this.
Not only that, what we are asked for is acceleration. Do we know the relation between force and acceleration? Do we? Yeah, that's what's called Newton's second law. F is equal to M A. So we also know that F is equal to M A. This is this is by definition of electric field. By definition of electric field, and this is true from Newton's second law. Okay, so putting these two things together, do you think we might be able to calculate acceleration if we are given the charge, if we are given the mass, and if we are given the electric field? We ought to be able to because we can say that, oh, Q times E must be equal to M times A, right? So putting those two things together, you can see that QE should be equal to MA or the acceleration will be equal to Q divided by M times E. By the way, this immediately tells you what is the direction of acceleration? Is it the same as the direction of electric field? Yes, because charge is scalar, mass is scalar, so the direction of acceleration and the direction of electric field are the same. And charge, remember, is positive here. Right? So let's only worry about the magnitude. So the magnitude of A will be Q over M times the magnitude of E. And you can plug in the numbers. Q is 10 power minus 6 Coulomb. Mass is 10 power minus 4 kg. And electric field is 2 Newton per Coulomb. <clears throat> and so this turns out to be equal to 10 to the power minus 2 times 2. And what would be the unit of acceleration? Yeah, meters per second squared. I didn't even have to write these units explicitly in the intermediate steps, so long as I always write it in the final step. And if I have converted everything into SI unit, I know the acceleration must be in meters per second square, right? That's the unit of acceleration in SI unit. Okay, great. So we have found the magnitude of acceleration and we know the direction of acceleration is same as the direction of electric field pointing down. So the direction of A is like this, right? Because that's the direction of electric field. We still need to find time. Can we use equations of kinematics that we had learned? Oh, we will need to find something. We need to be given one more thing. Suppose we, we are launching this particle with some initial speed v, which is 3 meters per second. This is the initial speed when the particle enters. And notice I'm launching it horizontally. For example, it's just like launching this thing horizontally with some speed. So if I'm launching it horizontally, this is the, let's call it the x direction, and let's call this the y direction. What component of velocity is this? x and this is the initial x component of velocity right but does the x component of velocity change here why doesn't it because you can really projectile motion you can decouple very good you can decouple the x and y motion and if the force is only acting in the vertical direction here just like in the case of gravitational force then that is the only direction that has an acceleration. And so that's the only direction in which the velocity is going to change. So the x component of velocity will not change here as well. So in other words, if you like, this is not just the x component of this charge's velocity. You know, this is not just the initial thing. It's also vx at any point. If you want ask me, what is the x component of this velocity? It's always going to be 3 meters per second, no matter where this charge particle is. Here also vx is equal to three meters per second, right? What is changing then? What is changing is the y component of velocity. And the particle started out with, what was the initial y component? Zero. So v zero y was zero because I launched the particle, just like launching this horizontally, I launched it with no y component at all. But as the particle falls, the y component keeps increasing because of the fact that the velocity, the, there is a force acting in that direction, 
right? That in, so will it this will it be the same kind of thing here? Except we are talking about which force? We are talking about electrostatic force pulling this charged particle down and making it go faster and faster, its y component of velocity will increase. But do you see that we can use the same exact equation of kinematics to find the time? So think, can you tell me what equation we might be able to use? Anybody remembers? Please. I was going to say, don't we need uh, the distance yeah. the particle is from the negative plate? Yeah, I think we should, we should actually choose some distance. Let's say this is 2 centimeters. That's a very good point. So in your problem, if you look at the problem on your web, web page, those things are all going to be given. So let's say that this is uh, 2 centimeters. Okay, very good. So this is my y. So anybody wants to tell what, what we might be able to use to figure out the time that it takes the particle to hit the surface? Go ahead, please. Uh, like the displacement equals 1 half acceleration t squared. Good. We can use, you know, any of those equations of kinematics like what you suggested would be a good one. So you are saying we might be able to make use of this. Y is equal to V0Y T plus half AY T square, right? In our case, the initial y component of velocity is 0 because this charged particle was launched horizontally. So v0y is 0, so this term is 0. So we just have y is equal to half a y t square. And from here, you can see I have t, y, t square is equal to 2y divided by a sub y. In other words, t is equal to square root of 2y divided by a y. Right? And <clears throat> if you wanted to do everything in a vector form, then you should really say, oh, if I am choosing this to be my positive y direction, then the correct way to do this will be to say the displacement y is negative 2 centimeter. Right? That would be the right way to. Similarly, it will be the right thing to say that the acceleration vector is going to be minus. 10 power minus 2 times 2 meters per second square y because acceleration is pointing down. Right? It wouldn't matter in the end in this problem because this is going to, just being systematic is a good thing. So you have 2 times y. So 2 times y, y we said is minus 2 centimeters. What is minus 2 centimeters? Minus 2 times 10 power minus 2 meters, right? And we have acceleration a y which is minus 10 power minus 2 times 2 meter per second square. Do you see that the minus sign and minus sign get cancelled which makes sense because time should be a positive thing and nothing in the square root should be negative to begin with and so what does this turn out to be? One of these two gets cancelled so I have square root 2 divided uh, yeah, that's it, square root 2 seconds. Right? Is everybody with me? Yeah? Okay, what if you were asked how much is the horizontal distance traveled in this much time? Could you find that? Suppose you are asked how much is the horizontal x distance traveled before as soon as you, it enters all the way till it hits the thing. How would you do that? Go ahead, please. Uh, displacement equals the time times, I mean. X displacement? Yeah, X displacement equals time times velocity. Very good. So what your friend is saying is that if we were asked what is the X displacement, which we could be asked, we know X displacement should be equal to V0X. We can do the same kind of thing, but it will be V0X plus half ax t square, right? But what is ax? What is the acceleration in the x direction? It's 0, right? Because acceleration is only pointing in this direction. And hence, this is 0. And so what we are left with is x is equal to v0x times t. But v0x we know is 3 meters per second. So this is 
3 meters per second times square root 2 seconds and this is equal to 3 times square root 2 meters, right? Anybody has any questions about this? Anybody folks? Please. Sorry, so, oh, so I put the value 2 times y and we said y was a negative displacement, it is a displacement vector, so we put minus 2 and centimeter went to 10 power minus 2 meter, so it is minus 2 times 10 power minus 2 meters, okay? And the bottom is this acceleration which is minus 2, 10 power minus 2 times 2 meter per second square. And the thing is minus and minus signs get cancelled, 2 and 2 get cancelled, 10 power minus 2 and 10 power minus 2 got cancelled, so we are left with square root 2 seconds. Any questions folks? Anybody? Okay, then let us touch upon the last topic of this chapter and that is the <coughs> torque on an electric dipole and energy stored in an electric dipole which is placed in an external electric field. So, what you might think of is this situation. Suppose you have, suppose you have this parallel plate capacitor and you put a dipole in this electric field. And we are only going to consider that case where the external electric field is uniform. So let us make it the same as what your book discusses which is uniform external electric field. So one way to think about it is here is my dipole, I have a plus charge, I have a minus charge, this is minus Q, this is plus Q, they are separated by some distance D. Remember this is what a dipole is? and it is placed in a uniform electric field, external electric field, something else is providing the electric field. What could be one thing that could provide a uniform field? Could it be a parallel plate capacitor? Yeah, so I could maybe put this dipole between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor, so maybe this could be positively charged plate, this could be negatively charged plate. Hey, now this dipole is in a uniform external electric field. Is everybody agreeing that this dipole now is in a uniform external electric field? Now the first question that we want to think about is does this dipole feel a force due to this electric field or not? Let us think about it, the whole dipole overall, does it feel a force or not? Let us think about it slowly. Which way is the force on the positive charge that forms the dipole? Remember F is equal to QE, right? So the force on this positive charge due to this external electric field, this is the direction of electric field, right? So at this point the electric field is this way, will the force be in the same direction? As the, yes. So on this charge plus Q, the force will be in this same direction and the force will be that way also. What about due to the negative, uh, on the negative charge? Is the negative charge still seeing the electric field that is pointing this way, right? But which way will be the force on it? See if this charge is negative, if the charge is negative, the electric field and force point opposite to each other. So you can see that the force will be this way on this negative charge, right? Okay. Now, what about the dipole overall? Let us say that this is a water molecule. Remember we said that a water molecule is an example of an electric dipole? So this is a water molecule. Now what happens, what we are saying is that the hydrogen side is feeling a force that way, oxygen side is feeling a force in the opposite direction, 
are these forces equal in magnitude also? Yes, because look, F is equal to QE in terms of magnitude. Both of these positive and negative charges have the same magnitude Q. The electric field is uniform, the same everywhere. So the force that they feel has the same magnitude, just opposite direction. So will you see this water, water molecule translating? Is there a force or net force on it? No, the answer is no. So F net on this dipole is zero. Why is it zero? Because the force on this and this cancel each other out. There's no overall force on this whole thing. So you will not see, so if the force is zero, that means acceleration is zero too, because F is equal to ma. And that means you will not see any translational motion of this water molecule. You wouldn't see the water molecules starting to get faster and faster. If it's at rest here, it'll stay at rest. At least its location will not change. Now in a minute, we'll see that water molecule will have what is called a torque. That means even though it's not feeling a net force, it is feeling a net torque which will try to rotate it. So it will cause an angular acceleration. So in the same place, it's like, you know, if I had this pencil here, if I give it opposite, equal and opposite forces on the two sides, I can cause an angular acceleration because there is a torque, but it doesn't translate because it doesn't have a translational acceleration A. Same thing with this plus and minus charges. Here, there is no linear acceleration, but there will be a torque which will cause it to rotate. Let's think about why there is a torque. Anybody remembers the definition of torque? Very good. So the thing is, if you remember, torque was defined as R cross P. And torque plays the same exact role that force plays in linear motion, right? In the rotational case, torque has the same exact role to play. So torque was defined in rotational motion as R cross <clears throat> P, sorry, R cross F, F is the force. Now the thing is, so what would be the magnitude of torque? Let's first think about the magnitude of torque. If the magnitude of R, magnitude of the force, times sine of the angle between the two, between the force and R, right? Let's say that this dipole is making an angle theta with the electric field, okay? In our case, by the way, the force can be written as what? Can we write the force as F is equal to QE? Can I write it as Q times E? So then theta will be the angle between the electric field and R, right? R is this vector, you know, R is the vector that's pointing from the negative to the positive charge. If you like, Q times R is like Q times D, okay? This R in this case is really D. How, how do I see that? You tell me how to find the torque here. We have to find the torque about some point. In this case, since forces are equal and opposite, what you will see, it wouldn't matter whether you find the torque about this point, this point, this point, this point. And I think since we are running out of time, I'm going to stop here. But next time what we will see, or try to just do it at home and we'll work out here again. What you will see is the torque will be force times this lever arm, this perpendicular distance, which will just turn out to be D times sine theta. All right, but we'll talk about it more next time. And so let's stop right here. Have a great weekend, folks. Professor Singh is a lecturer in the physics department at the University of Pittsburgh. For more information about Professor Singh and her research, visit her website in the description below.